Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. We have a big group of participants expected. So I'm going to give it a couple minutes to allow for more people to join, and then we'll start with the agenda. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar. I'm going to give it another minute or two to allow for more people to join. We have over 5,000 registrants for today's webinar, so it may take a little bit of time to get more people on. So I'll be back with you soon, thanks. Hi everybody, thanks for joining today's webinar. We still have people coming in at a pretty rapid clip, so I'm gonna give it about one more minute and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Diane Yantel. I'm president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We have over well over 5,000 people that are registered for today's webinar. And as you can see, people are still joining at a pretty rapid rate. We have over, it looks like close to 1,800 people on. Uh, but I do want to get started because we have such a full agenda for this the second in a series of webinars hosted by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities on Homelessness and Housing First. So decades of learning, experience, and research have proven that Housing First is the most effective approach for ending homelessness. Housing First recognizes that affordable and accessible homes are the foundation on which people thrive. And by combining housing with access to supportive services, 
Housing First can help people exit homelessness and live stably in their communities. But unfortunately, in communities across the country, some misguided policymakers are responding to the growing homelessness crisis by advancing dangerous rhetoric and harmful dehumanizing measures that will make it even harder for people to exit homelessness. So it is so important that advocates nationwide are unified in pushing back against these stigmatizing and counterproductive efforts that seek to criminalize homelessness, impose punitive requirements, and even at times prevent the development of affordable housing. As our communities are struggling with soaring inflation, skyrocketing rents, increased evictions, and in many cases, as a result, more homelessness, it's more important than ever that we work together to advance proven solutions to ensure stable, affordable, and accessible homes for all people experiencing and at risk of homelessness. So thanks again very much for all of you for being here today. Thanks again to NLIHC's national partners in this work, the National Alliance to End Homelessness and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and many thanks to all of our speakers uh, on today's webinar. I will turn now to our first, which is uh, Greg Colburn from the University of Washington. And he has written this fantastic book, uh, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, How Structural Factors Explain U.S. Patterns. I have my copy right here. This is the, for many of us who have been working on this uh, issue for years or decades, this book is so important, and I highly recommend that all of you on this webinar get a copy and read it closely. It provides a lot of the data and the information that helps us make the case um, that homelessness is indeed a housing problem. So I'm so pleased to have Greg on the line today. And Greg, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all the partners for hosting the event today and for all of you taking your time out of your day to uh, to join us. Um, I am going to speak um, quickly today because I want to get through a lot of content and, and give you a brief summary, with, summary of the arguments that my co-author uh, Clayton Alder and I make uh, in our book. And at the end, I'll tie this into the broader conversation related to Housing First, which is obviously the, the purpose of, of these uh, webinars. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. Uh, as Diane mentioned, that's the book. The University of California Press is our uh, publisher, and uh, they have been great partners in, uh, in this project. Um, next slide, please. So what really prompted me to, to want to write this book was I have been in, in Seattle for uh, just over five years now and been involved in a lot of community efforts around the housing and homelessness issue. And it, it became clear to me when I would leave meetings, I was a little frustrated that I didn't have a sense that we as a community really understood what was driving, what the root cause of this crisis was. Um, there was a broad agreement that we had a crisis, but not broad agreement on what was causing it. And part of that is because um, I believe as a researcher that we have a unit of analysis problem, meaning causes at the individual level don't necessarily map to the causes at a community level, which I'll talk about a little bit. And as a result, we sometimes focus on what I would think, uh, what I think are potentially the wrong issues. So for example, when we conduct the point in time homeless count, we actually ask people questions about their experience with homelessness and we get responses like this. Why are you experiencing homelessness? Well, I got in a fight with my uh, roommate. Uh, I got separated from my partner. I was evicted. I'm using drugs or alcohol, et cetera. And so when we read these accounts in the newspaper or in the press, we start to draw these conclusions about homelessness that I think at some times are maybe um, undermine our ability as a community to really respond in an appropriate way. Next slide, please. And so what I like to do and what we do in the book is to, to try to draw a distinction between root causes of homelessness and other causes that I would consider to be precipitating events, right? If divorce is a root cause of homelessness, we should have a heck of a lot more homelessness in this country, given the rate of divorce that we have, right? And so what we would identify that to be is, is divorce certainly can be a cause of homelessness in the right or wrong context. It is a precipitating event that can lead someone to experiencing uh, homelessness. And so what we're trying to do here is is focus on the fundamental root cause of why homelessness is so uh, pronounced in certain geographies and not in others, right? And then 
And the purpose, therefore, of the book is to really center housing in this conversation, because if we don't center housing in the conversation, I firmly believe that we will struggle to uh, put a dent in the crisis of homelessness in our country. Next slide, please. So a quick analogy to draw the distinction between an individual driver and a, and a, and a structural driver is the game of musical chairs. So imagine 10 friends, 10 chairs. Uh, the leader takes one chair out, plays music, music stops. Mike, who's on crutches, loses the game. And if we were to ask Mike, why do you think you lost the game, Mike? He'd say, well, I had a bad ankle. And that makes perfect sense. Within the rules of the game, which is 10 people in nine chairs, Mike's vulnerability, his ankle injury, likely did cause him to lose the game. But if we take a step back and really think about what is going on here, the reality is Mike lost the game because there weren't enough chairs. And this is what's happening in communities all around our nation right now, which is vulnerabilities identify the people who are most likely to lose the game. And in this case, we're thinking about the game of securing housing, and it's not a game, it's a serious, serious issue. And so the fact that we observe someone who might be mentally ill or addicted on the street um, causes us to maybe make a causal relationship that may in fact um, not be the case, right? It shouldn't surprise us that people who are experiencing poverty or other um, risk factors are likely to experience homelessness in LA and San Francisco and Seattle and New York and Boston and Washington DC, right? The, the cities where homelessness is most pronounced in, in our country. Next slide, please. And so we know from research that drug use, mental illness, poverty, increase the risk of homelessness at the individual level. And so then the question is, is when we think about communities with really, really high rates of homelessness, is it because we have more people with those conditions in those cities? That's the key question here. And the answer to that question is no, that's not the reason, right? And so we know that drug use produces homelessness in some contexts and not others. We want to understand why. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the book is to add, uh, answer a pretty simple question, which is, what explains regional variation rates of homelessness? And so for my home in Seattle, um, when I get presentations here, I say, why would Seattle have four to five times the rate of homelessness of Chicago? It's an interesting question. Is it because we have more people with these vulnerabilities, these individual vulnerabilities? Uh, in fact, the answer to that question, as I said, is no. So we need to look for another explanation. Next slide, please. So this is a book about cities, not about people. It doesn't mean that individually focused research isn't important, it's terribly important. But what we're trying to do here is, is to take the lens off the individual on the street and think about what it is, what is it about certain jurisdictions that produce disproportionate rates of homelessness. And once we understand that, we can then use that to understand what's driving this crisis at a national level. Okay. And the thesis of our book is that tight housing markets accentuate vulnerabilities and produce disproportionate rates of homelessness in typically our coastal cities. And the individual vulnerabilities that we typically think about as causes of homelessness really serve as a sorting mechanism by identifying people who are most likely to lose housing when housing is scarce and tight. Next slide, please. Next slide. So just to orient people in terms of this variation, um, and this requires a longer discussion. So if you're interested in this more deeply, I would encourage you to access the book. But when we think about um, variation, what we'll see is um, some places count homelessness at a city level, some count it at a county level. But what's important here is that there's about a five to one re relationship between high and low uh, homeless uh, rate jurisdictions. So for example, New York is about five times uh, Chicago and Indianapolis. LA County is about five times Hillsborough County. So this is the, the variation that we're trying to explain uh, in the book. Next slide, please. So we take three kind of buckets of explanations and I'm gonna go through these really quickly so that we can get onto the other panelists here. But um, the first bucket is, is individual explanations. Um, next slide, please. And the most obvious individual explanation of homelessness is poverty, right? We know that if you have unlimited fin financial resources, you're far more likely to experience homelessness. But what's really interesting is when you plot rates of poverty, which would be on the x-axis here, the, the bottom axis. So that would be the percentage of people in a community who are uh, below the federal poverty line. And when you uh, relate that to rates of homelessness, which is on the Y or the vertical axis, what you see is actually communities with high rates of poverty have lower rates of homelessness, which seems like a really odd result because we know poverty causes homelessness. And so when you when to put some names to, to this figure, the lower right um, portion of this would be places like Detroit. Very, very high rates of poverty, the most impoverished city in the country, but relatively low rates of homelessness, far lower than what you would see in relatively affluent communities like Seattle and San Francisco, which have very, very low rates of poverty. So we don't have a problem in Seattle because we have more poor people. In fact, in fact, we have far fewer poor people than in many other cities around the country. So we can't blame at a community level poverty for the homeless crisis. Next slide, please. 
The same thing is true with mental illness and, and drugs. And this, this data is actually taken from the state level based on um, how data are gathered. But what you see here is that there is some variation in rates of mental illness, but it bears no relationship whatsoever to rates of homelessness. The R squared is a statistical measure as that get, gets closer to one, you have more um, explanatory power. 0 0.05 is basically a nothing burger. There's really no relationship here. So it's not that California and Oregon and Washington and New York and Massachusetts have more people with serious mental illness. It's just the consequences of those conditions are different in, in those places than in others. Next slide. Same story with um, substance use disorders. Again, there's variation. And again, there's basically no statistical relationship. So it's not that we have more people who are using drugs um, in, in Washington to explain our, our high rates of homelessness. Next slide. So the second category of explanations you look at is local context. What, it is, what is it about certain places that produce lots of homelessness? Next slide. So I hear weather all the time. Um, mild weather on the West Coast explains homelessness. But in fact, when you plot January temperature, which is when we do the census uh, of homelessness, what you'll see is there's really no relationship whatsoever uh, between weather and homelessness. So we can't blame Mother Nature here. Next slide. Um, this is um, welfare benefits. We frequently hear that generous benefits are a draw, that people will move to, to jurisdictions with generous benefits, and therefore we end up with lots of homelessness in, in um, cities like Seattle or San Francisco. Um, but in fact, this is um, looking at TANF, which is the primary welfare benefit for, for typically women and children. And what you'll see is there's huge variation in generosity of TANF and zero relationship to rates of homelessness. So we don't see this kind of magnet effect. Next slide. I also hear frequently that there's a mobility argument here that people are moving to certain places to experience homelessness and therefore uh, these coastal cities end up with high rates of homelessness. But what's interesting is the low income mi migration rate here is inversely related to homelessness. So places with higher in migration of low income households actually have lower rates of homelessness. And so are there some poor people moving into Seattle and San Francisco and New York and Boston? Sure there are, but at far lower rates than in other communities. So we don't necessarily see this disproportionate um, migration that might explain regional variation. Next slide, please. And lastly, when we think about politics, um, frequently, you know, left-leaning politics are blamed for homelessness. But what, what that argument doesn't really account for is the fact that there are a lot of cities uh, in the United States that are run by Democrats. And you may like that, you may not like that. That's just a reality. Um, and so if Democratic policies are to blame, why do we not have a homelessness problem in Chicago and Cleveland and St. Louis and, and other cities that have, have been and continue to be run by Democrats, right? And so again, it's a convenient explanation, but it doesn't really hold up when you look at it a little more broadly. Next slide, please. So the final um, category of explanations are housing market conditions. Next slide. And when you plot um, rents, and this is just median contract rent in each of these jurisdictions, what we start to see is higher R squareds, meaning there's a stronger relationship between this variable and rates of homelessness. Generally speaking, where rent is high, homelessness tends to be high. Next slide. A related variable is rental market vacancy rate. How um, easy is it to access housing? Typically when rental market vacancy rates are low, homelessness tends to be high. So the point of the book is that if you give me a city and don't tell me the name and you give me what their rents are and what their rental market vacancy rates, I can tell you with a fairly high degree of confidence when they're, whether they're gonna have a problem with homelessness. And, and it's not a perfect relationship and we wouldn't suggest that we can explain all variation, but it's a pretty strong signal. Um, so I've got a, a couple more minutes here and I wanna um, tie this um, together a little bit and then, and then hand it back to uh, Diane for some, for some Q and A. But I wanna explain a little bit about why is it that in certain places in the country, we end up with radically different housing markets than other places? Next slide, please. Um, and I'm not gonna get into this due, due to time, but if you're interested in the economics of housing, understanding the supply response when people move to a jurisdiction is really important. Do you build a lot of housing or do you not? And what we see, next slide, please. What we see on this slide is there are a lot of places in the country that have had rapid population growth on the right side of this slide. San Francisco, Boston, Seattle, Dallas, San Antonio, Charlotte, Austin. The difference between these communities is some of these communities build a lot of housing in response. Those in the bubble in the upper right quadrant have high su uh, supply elasticity, meaning as prices go up, they build a bunch of housing. And as a result, those numbers in parentheses, which are their vacancy rates have stayed relatively high. The bottom right quadrant, which is inelastic housing supply and rapid growth is the perfect storm for housing prices. And while tragic, it shouldn't surprise anyone that San Francisco, Boston, and Seattle are having a problem with homelessness and housing uh, issues. Next slide. 
And so when we think about what are we going to do about this, um, you know, a lot of our investment and effort around homelessness have been on what I would call operating investments. Investments to fund housing support, maintenance services, all of these are essential. You think about the shelter system, these operating investments are critical, they're life-saving, but they're not ending homelessness, right? And so we also need to think about then on the supply side, we need capital investments to construct housing. We need private developers to build market rate housing, and we need um, subsidized housing that is affordable to people who can't afford market rate housing. And failure to do that undermines our ability to take advantage of these operating investments. And I think Housing First is a prime example of this. I hear this all the time when I'm in meetings in Seattle and people said, Greg, if Housing First is so good, why do I see all these unsheltered homeless folks on the, on the street? And I'll say, well, the key, we know that Housing First works and we're gonna hear this from people on the panel today, but Housing First needs a housing unit. So the scarcity of housing that we have in a lot of communities around our nation is actually undermining our ability to use the tools that are best at, uh, that are best at dealing with the crisis. And so if we know that housing first works, but we don't have a place to put people and use that intervention in Seattle and San Francisco and LA, um, we are um, kind of sentencing ourselves, our community to um, dealing with this problem in, in perpetuity, which I certainly hope won't be the case. And so we need to elevate these interventions. We need to support them financially. And we need to make sure that our jurisdictions, state and local jurisdictions are ensuring that we have the tools in place the regulatory framework in place that we could that such that we can build the housing that we desperately desperately need to to end this crisis so i'm going to stop it there turn it back to diane and, and thank you again for the opportunity great thanks so much greg that was an excellent presentation really important inf and helpful information to everybody that's on this webinar and beyond um, so thanks again for your work. There are several questions, um, and I encourage people to put your questions into the Q&A box. We won't be able to get to all of them today, but we will get to some, and then we will follow up with others that we're not able to answer now um, with answers in the future. So, uh, Greg, one of the first questions um, that came in which I now can't find. Okay, let me ask another one. Um, one that comes from Michael Adams. And he asks, he says, several cities are experiencing a negative rate of affordable housing growth. This is often the result of out-of-state real estate investor syndicates that are buying affordable rental housing and flipping them to market rate housing. In, in his city, this is taking hundreds of affordable rental homes out of the affordable inventory, how to put the brakes on this predatory activity. Any thoughts that you have on that, Greg? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, I think it's the Charlotte Observer, the big newspaper in Charlotte just did a great uh, study on this. And, and I talked to the reporter who, is, who um, did this. And the question that I posed to the, to the reporter was, um, this is a really interesting question that I actually has um, a lot of implications, legal implications, in the sense that in the United States, it's legal for us to buy things. Right, the government typically doesn't tell me what I can buy. I can go out and buy a house. I can go out and buy two houses. I can buy three houses. And so it is an interesting question now to say, and I think there's a broad agreement that that huge institutional ownership of the housing supply could be a problem. The question then is, is what is the mechanism that jurisdictions can use to either frustrate that? I think there are some, there are some fees and taxes that might do that. There might be some occupancy type issues related, um, but fundamentally, um, that is, uh, there are, it's an open question uh, <laughs> that is, is being debated right now in the sense that, is there a social concern here, a social good that's at jeopardy, and therefore, what are the regulatory or legal tools at, at communities' uh, disposal? And I, and I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, I'm sure um, both the Alliance and the Coalition have some thoughts on that, um, but it is uh, an increasing problem. And what's interesting is it's actually a bigger problem in some of the Sunbelt cities that have had more abundant housing than in places like Seattle because the housing has been more affordable. And so what we're seeing is the squeeze is happening in the Sunbelt cities uh, and, and elevating that issue. Yeah, thank you, Greg. And we will be on the next webinar, we'll be talking more in depth about long-term solutions. So we'll touch on that issue as well. Um, another question came in from an anonymous attendee, and you did touch on this during your presentation and certainly in your book, but I want to give you a chance to respond to it again um, separately. And the question is, isn't part of where homelessness exists, doesn't part of it have to do to some extent with weather? A person couldn't survive in the streets in Chicago in winter, for example. 
Yeah, weather is one of the most uh, frequent conversations. But as, as, I, as I laid out in that graph, when you look at rates of homelessness, it bears no relationship to weather. And so when we think about weather and homelessness, everyone's mind goes, at least my mind goes to LA and San, Francisco, er, and San Diego. Sure, that makes sense. But what we ignore is that there are plenty of other warm places in January that don't have a problem with homelessness in you at that scale. They still have a problem, but Miami and Dallas and Phoenix and other locations have far lower rates of homelessness. We also ignore the fact that Boston and New York, which are far from pleasant in, in January, have significant homeless populations, as does Minneapolis, which is terribly cold, my, my home state. And so um, now there is a question about whether we have shelter capacity, and that has a relationship to weather, which is a longer conversation. But when you're looking at the total homeless population, weather is not the explanatory issue. They're cold places with lots of homelessness, and they're warm places without. Thanks, Greg. Another question from another anonymous attendee says, these graphs are helpful, but I assume you also did multivariate regressions to control for other observed factors when trying to understand the relationship between levels of homelessness and any given variable. And if you want to speak to that. Yeah, we've done um, far more um, sophisticated statistical analysis, as have many other people in the homeless community that we cite in our book. And so the purpose of the book is to um, to share these statistical relationships in an accessible way. And so for those of you who do have um, training in, in multivariate models, uh, we do discuss that in the book and, and certainly cite a lot of research that, that demonstrates the same relationships with more rigorous uh, models. But I certainly have learned in my time as a teacher and a presenter that um, you can lose an audience pretty quickly if, if that's the, the sole way you're trying to make your point. And so we're trying to do something that's relatively intuitive for a broad audience here. Mm -hmm. And then, Greg, the last question I'll ask you for today um, comes from Sarah Bush, who asks, how can we bring this understanding of community versus individual causes of homelessness to state and local legislators? You know, I think, I think um, you know, I view my job as a little bit of, uh, of as being an evangelist to a certain extent in, in talking about this. And I think um, a lot of people can, can do the same. Um, and I, I really think it's just a, a kind of a grassroots effort. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book. And so when people say, I, I bought your book for an elected leader, that makes me smile uh, because I think that's one way we can do it. But certainly I'm not gonna be the only one doing that. The Alliance does great work here. The coalition does great work on this. And so I really encourage people to have this conversation with, with folks. I use my social circles as a test on this. And I always have conversations with people about that and, and really draw the distinction between individual drivers and, and community level efforts. And so I think everyone on this call can in a small way have an impact on, on redirecting our focus here. Because if we don't redirect our focus and center housing on this, I really, really fear that we're not gonna get over uh, the, this crisis and we're gonna have to, to continue to live with this, which would be an absolute tragedy from a, from a human perspective. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Greg. And I think your book and your work is going to be really helpful to that effort that all of us are making together. So thank you again very much for your work. And thanks for joining the webinar today. Thank you, Diane. And for others, we have certainly far more questions than we can answer on the webinar or um, by, for, by, from each speaker. So thank you for continuing to put your questions into the Q&A box. I encourage you to continue doing so. We will be following up in some ways with fact sheets or Q, um, FAQs to respond to many of these questions. And I just wanna note again that a lot of the questions that are coming in right now are related to the solutions. And a reminder that the next webinar, which happens in two weeks, will be focusing primarily on solutions. So we'll have a much longer conversation and, and, and an opportunity to get to some of those questions then. So our, uh, in addition to talking about the, the research and the data and the analysis so important to our work, we also want to talk about examples, um, specific examples and proof of how Housing First is working in local communities. And so I'm really pleased to have our next speakers who are from Houston, Texas, which many of you may have seen and hopefully read the story in the New York Times that was entitled, How Houston Moved 25,000 People from the Streets into Homes of Their Own. And um, we, in follow-up information, we can share the link to that news article with you all. So we have on the line um, two people from the organization that was featured in that story. So Anna Rush and Jessica Preheim from the Coalition for the Homeless of Houston, Harris County, um, will share with us a little bit about best practices in Houston. 
Uh, Anna and Jessica, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can go to the first slide. Next one, thanks. So I'm Anna Roush. I'm gonna do a quick overview and then pass it over to my partner. Um, so Houston, these slides just kind of give you an idea of how large our continuum of care is. We have three counties, Houston, Harris, and Harris County, Fort Bend County, and Montgomery County, excuse me, which is about 3,700 square miles. But Houston is very, very large. We are larger than the cities of Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, Phoenix, and San Diego. And if Houston were a country, it would rank as the 26th largest economy in the world. So just to give you a sense of how large we are. Next slide. And so the Coalition for the Homeless, we are a nonprofit and we are the lead organization for the TX 700 Continuum of Care, which we renamed The Way Home. Uh, we are also the HMIS and Coordinated Access or Coordinated Entry Lead. We call it Coordinated Access. Um, our 2022 PIT was 3,223 individuals, 1,500 unsheltered, and 1,700 unsheltered. We believe that permanent housing and housing first is really the only way to effectively end homelessness. I'm going to pass it over to my coworker, Jess. Go ahead, Jess. Next slide. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so to Anna's point, um, it's exactly that. Um, in 2011, our real reality here in Houston was that we were not doing very well. We had the sixth largest homeless population in the country. We were uh, giving money back and we were also spending money that wasn't keeping people stably housed. So we were really you know, finding that uh, we were investing in solutions that just weren't working. Next slide. And so we had a series of events that unfolded uh, that really started us on a journey uh, for Housing First and thinking about housing as a solution to ending homelessness. Uh, we received technical assistance from HUD. This sounds like it could be a really good thing, but really HUD said, you know what, you guys are not performing and you need to do better. Uh, so we came together as a community and we started an open dialogue and conversation about solutions. Uh, we had a week-long community event, a charrette that was led by our mayor at the time, um, Anise Parker, who really brought together everyone who was working in this space and those who should be working on this in this space that may not be. And we all came together and decided, you know, we're doing things different and we were going to identify common goals to move us forward. Next slide. So with that, um, and in these conversations, we really started to think about what are the barriers that we are putting in place as service providers, as funders, as governmental partners that are not moving us forward into the solution that's working for individuals we served. We started to think about how we simplify our processes. Uh, we had a lot of self-imposed steps that we could eliminate. We started also thinking about how we align funding. A lot of times money was going out the door um, but it wasn't going out in the door into the programs, into the people that really needed it. And so we really uh, brought together all of our governmental and private funders to think about aligned funding, aligned collaboration, and then also invested um, a lot of time into the capacity building for our service providers. And most importantly, we really made our decisions using data. Uh, this is something that Anna's going to go into, um, but it was one of the it was one of the things that just started to move us forward. We did not make decisions without data, and we also acknowledged that we were not going to plan ourselves into a hole. We were going to act and address and act and pivot. Next slide. And, you know, with this, we really thought about how that oversight looked like. Communication is key here in Houston. A lot of times people ask us what works and we communicate and we trust each other. Um, but with that, we are very intentional with our structure of how we really worked on the homeless response system. So we created a very uh, large network of uh uh, work groups uh, throughout our community. There is uh, representation from all of the system partners who touch homelessness or affordable housing. And then we restructured our governance uh, so that those who are on the board of our homeless response system were really the, um, the funders uh, who invested into the solution of homelessness. Next slide. Anna? So we were really, um, you know, we put the, the bulk of our funding into permanent housing. We ended veteran homelessness in 2015 with a strategic plan that came out of all of this planning process that Jess described. And then in 2017, we were um, hit with this guy, Hurricane Harvey. 
Um, this, this picture that you see here in front of you um, is what it looked like, the same area, what it looked like during um, Harvey and right after. So we had a lot of devastating, and we, we have that kind of, those types of events here in Houston quite often. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're so, um, we, we help each other so much is because we have been unfortunate victims of so many disasters. Next slide. So these are some crazy um, statistics about uh, Harvey. Um, we, you know, 19 trillion gallons of rainwater fell on parts of Texas. And we had so many thousands and thousands of affordable housing units were destroyed. The Houston Housing Authority alone estimated that 1,000 affordable housing units were destroyed. Uh, next slide. So really up until Harvey, we placed about 21,000 people into housing. Um, our programs had about a 90% success rate. That's rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. We reduced homelessness by 54%. But then we had seen this downward trajectory of our homeless numbers. But then in two, in, um, after Harvey, 18% of the individuals stated that they were homeless as a result of the hurricane. Um, so we, we got to a point where our homeless population was a little bit stagnant because we've been used to just that downward trend. Um, and then meet, being able to meet the need with the funding that was coming in. But we knew we needed to make a little bit of a change to kind of get over that hump um, and really make a dent in our homeless numbers. Next slide. So the majority of the 18% increase that I mentioned due to Harvey was in the unsheltered population since so many people lost homes. And these are people that actually answered the question, I became homeless um, as a direct impact of Hurricane Harvey. And so although we were doing a great job of housing people and getting them off the streets, it didn't look like it. Um, we knew that we really needed to, to um, tell the story. We still do. This is something that we struggle with on a daily basis is how to tell the story of um, what individuals are seeing on the streets versus what we're actually reporting. So there was a new permanent supportive housing project coming online that we wanted to utilize to close our very first encampment. Uh, we knew that the only effective way that we could decommission an encampment was to offer housing. We didn't want to move people to a different location because that wouldn't fix the problem. It would just move the problem. So we really integrated the, um, we spearheaded the integration of housing into the COC's encampment response. And the, the success of the encampment closure that we tried for the first time really led to the creation of additional permanent housing projects to close even more encampments. And so even some of our local philanthropy partners were very interested, particularly in the downtown area where there was a heavy concentration of individuals living unsheltered. Um, and so we used lessons learned from Housing for Harvey where we had a landlord engagement process, a centralized uh, process for uh, acquiring market rate units. And we put that to work with our encampment response. Next slide, Jess. So then the coronavirus came to our world. Uh, right before this happened, uh, we again, we always look at our data. Um, one thing about Houston is we initially, when we started this planning process, we invested in affordable housing, our partnerships with our housing authority. One thing with us is it, housing first is not housing alone. Uh, so us as a community really, you know, came together to think about how are we going to fund those services? What is our deficit in affordable housing units? We had initially uh, made a goal to create 2,500 units of permanent supportive housing. We achieved that goal. Um, but in 2019, we were really, you know, going through our, our process. It took us longer than we thought to create those 2,500 units, and we still had a deficit. So we were mapping out how many more units of rapid rehousing in our community we needed, how many more units of permanent supportive housing in our community we needed to really continue to see the reductions in homelessness. Next slide. Next slide. And in the middle of this planning process, the pandemic hit. Uh, when the pandemic first initially hit, we were like many cities. We were thinking about, you know, how do we set up quarantine and isolation facilities? How do we set up testing programs? What is that emergent res emergency response um, to this unknown world? And then with the um, introduction of CARES Act funding, we really stepped back. And, you know, we always say to ourselves, homelessness was a public health emergency before the pandemic, and it continued to be a public health emergency, and even more so during the pandemic. And so we worked with our city and our county in philanthropic community and said, we want to invest this once in a lifetime uh, resources into the solution that is going to end um, people's homelessness, which is housing. Uh, so our city and county came together and invested $65 million into what we call the Community COVID Housing Program, which uh, I think I need to hurry up. So next slide, Anna. 
really worked to do a few things to create the solutions that we know worked. So it was a, uh, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity to really surge um, and increase our permanent supportive housing beds. We increased rapid rehousing. We introduced diversion to our system, which we have never had. We've really never had the opportunity to think about the feeders into homelessness and how we can stop upstream um, from really um, putting an end to, um, to homelessness. And then the mental health, uh, you know, mental health and auxiliary services that we know keep people stably housed. Next slide. So thus far, our CHIP program kicked off in October of 2020, and we have served 10,248 individuals as of August 9th of this year, um, 1,849 in permanent supportive housing, 3,784 in rapid rehousing, 4,615 in diversion. Overall, it's a little bit over 6,300 households. About 81% of these are singles, which has led to a significant decrease in the amount of one bedroom units that we have available. And so for the first time, Houston is starting to feel the tightening of our housing market. Next slide. Um, landlord engagement has been one of the most important resources in us being able to house this many people in less than two years. Um, we, again, as I mentioned, we, we took this experience from Housing for Harvey where we put a call out for landlords to contribute units to people in the disaster shelter. Within 24 hours, we had 3,000 units available. So this led us to create the landlord engagement process that we have. We offer a $1,600 um, landlord incentive fee per unit. Um, and so in order to work with the homeless response system, the landlord gets that, but they have to you know, remove criminal background restrictions, remove income requirements, um, agree to turn over applications within 24 to 48 hours and, and things that normally are a barrier for clients that we serve in our system. Next slide. Um, CHIP also enabled us to really launch um, an encampment decommissioning program that has demonstrated proven results in placing individuals living on the streets into housing. So um, we actually wrote an encampment response manual um, written due to our success in closing the encampments and housing so many people. Uh, next slide. And then really this unit acquisition and holding fees, uh, we really believe that it does have some time on equalizing time in the housing across racial demographics. Uh, for some of those, of those of you that have been in direct services, you understand that you're taking an individual from one apartment to another, probably to be told no, there's no availability or the landlord's denying them. Whereas a centralized process where the individual is choosing units from um, a location and viewing the pictures online, um, rather than meeting with the landlord, um, you can see there on the right, the average number of days from referral to move in prior to the pandemic for individuals of color um, was higher. And then after um, the CHIP program started, we did get those days down quite a bit. And then over to the left, you'll see the number of individuals that we've engaged, the number of encampments that we've decommissioned, and then uh, the breakdown as far as from the encampments, who's going to permanent supportive housing and who's going to rapid rehousing. Next slide. So this is our reduction in homelessness since 2013, 63% overall, and then the breakdown for family, chronic, and overall homelessness, and then, of course, uh, functional zero for veteran homelessness in 2015. Next slide. This is just a quick slide on how Houston compares to other cities. Um, and next slide. So one of the things I did want to mention is that in 2021 alone, the Partners of the Way Home placed more than 3,800 people in permanent housing. Over 50% of these individuals being housed were previously unsheltered or living in a place not meant for human habitation. Um, so this percentage has really stayed pretty consistent in the past two years since we've implemented CHIP. So we believe that our homeless count would likely be higher had we not put the majority of our funding into permanent solutions. In fact, um, a lot of cities saw an increase in their homeless numbers while we saw a 20% reduction during COVID. Next slide, Jess. And with that, uh, we are now looking to do it again. Um, our city and county, because of the success, have really come together and have continued to think about aligned funding. Uh, so we have joined together uh, with city and county to invest $100 million into uh, housing and serving another 7,000 individuals by the end of 2024 using the ARPA resources. So this was a great, um, great partnership with our state as well um, to really invest in housing as a solution to homelessness. Next slide. We just wanted to put a few pictures. These are the individuals that we're housing. These are the individuals who now have a lease in their own name. Um, that's very important when we talk about permanent supportive housing. It's housing like any of us would have. Um, so leases in their own name, moving in. Next slide. Same here. And I, I believe that is it. 
Oh, just just one last visual for everyone. We have housed uh, this is our this is our soccer stadium, um, and so we have officially housed more people than fit in our soccer stadium since 2011. So we just wanted to kind of have the visual out there of what it actually looks like and the impact that communities can have. That's a great visual to end on, <clears throat> Jessica and Anna, and just really tremendous work that you've done. Thank you for your work, and thanks for sharing it today. We have a, a couple of questions. Um, that I will ask of you and more that will follow up later to answer in other ways. But uh, one question comes from April, April Campbell, who asks whether your work included people with lived expertise, and if so, what lessons learned you could share there? Yes, uh, so our uh, lived expertise, we made that a part of our governance structure when we from day one when we started to really rethink how we we're going to be organized as a homeless response system. So we have individuals with lived experience who are on the governing board of our continuum of care um, and we are still learning and growing. Um, we do have advisory boards um, for individuals uh, with lived experience to help inform policy change. I obviously, I, I think everyone has has growth that they need to continue to do, um, and we are still looking to do that. But we do try to incorporate um, voices of lived experience in decision making in our system. Great, thank you. And we have a, a question that several people have asked, and I'll ask the one that comes from Mrs. Brown who's asking what funding streams you used to do this work and how much of the money was from city, county, state, and or developers, were bonds issued, what was used as collateral, and did HUD provide grant money? <laughs> well, so we do a lot with federal resources. Um, we do have a revenue capped city. Um, and until recently, we've had no general revenue from the county um, going into homeless solutions. So we really work to maximize every dollar of both entitlement and continuum of care resources that are possible, while then working with our city and county to really invest in the bricks and sticks and our housing authorities to align subsidy. Um, so mainly, uh, we really rely on on HUD resources, um, as well as our state really kind of invest in the in the, you know, the tax credit side. Um, as well as their entitlement dollars, but we've just given ourselves the challenge that if we spend a dollar, we're going to do it wisely and for the right person. And just having that shift of, of thinking about how you spend the resources you have access to really makes a difference. Our COVID response dollars are CARES Act and ARPA resources, and it has been um, about a, a, an equal split um, between the city and county, um, um, between each phase of our, of our, um, our adventure post-COVID. Great, and then the last question I'll ask you now live comes from CJ O'Hara, who's asking, uh, in the over 10,000 people housed in Houston, are you, tracking, um, are you tracking if people are falling back into homelessness or we if are. they're previous clients? Yes, we are. We are tracking first time homeless and returns to homelessness. So our permanent supportive housing programs have about a 95% success rate right now, meaning, um, you know, less than 5% are returning to homelessness and are and less than 5% are also um, exiting uh, negative exits. Rapid rehousing is about 88% to 90%. So we look back at 12 months, um, 18 months, 24 months. Um, diversion is, uh, so the, the outcome for diversion is that 80% for us, the success would have been 80% individuals that receive a diversion assist assistance don't enter the homeless response system. Um, so we're at about 84% right now for diversion. That's fantastic. Thank you again both so much for, for your work and thanks so much for joining today's webinar to share it. There are follow-up questions which we'll share with you afterwards, but a reminder to everybody on the webinar that we'll be sharing these slides and a recording of this webinar with everybody who's participated. And we'll share in it as well the link to the New York Times article that also does a good job of um, giving an overview of the work that you just heard about. So thanks again for joining. We're going to stick with the topic of Housing First success stories. And I'm going to um, uh, introduce now Dora Leon Gallo, who is the um, president and CEO of a community of friends. She is also the chair of the board of directors of the National Income Housing Coalition. 
and she is going to talk about success in ending homelessness for people with disabilities or substance use disorders. So Dora, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Diane. Hi, everyone. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and the one after that. So an introduction to our organization, uh, a community of friends. We were founded uh, in 1988 uh, as a nonprofit affordable housing developer with a very specific mission of ending homelessness through the provision of quality permanent supportive housing for people with mental illness. We are based out of Los Angeles. Um, and as many of you know, and as Greg mentioned in his book, not everyone experiencing homelessness has a mental illness or substance addiction. It's actually a very small subset of the people who are unhoused, maybe 25 to 30 percent in various communities. Um, and our organization specifically focuses on those people who do have these type of disabilities. We currently operate 43 buildings uh, throughout Los Angeles and into Orange County, housing over 2,600 adults and children. We serve individuals, families, veterans, older adults, and emancipated foster youth. We are a developer and operator, which means we provide services as well as to, uh, handle property management. The next slide. This is kind of a pictorial representation of our properties. Um, we're mostly in Los Angeles County, uh, but we also have some in Orange County. And we recently expanded into the Inland Empire with projects in Redlands and Riverside. And we also just started construction on, on a large veterans project in the city of Ventura. Next slide. A little quick rehab, uh, recap on what supportive housing is. It's a type of housing option that provides what we believe the most independence and the most stability for people who've experienced homelessness and have a disabling condition. It has there various components. One is that it's an apartment. It is not interim housing. It is not shelters. Um, everyone living in our building has a lease. Uh, supportive housing is specifically for people experiencing homelessness and have a disability, including addiction. And for us, our primary focus has been on mental health. Housing is not time limited in permanent supportive housing because people have a lease. They can live there indefinitely. The rent is affordable. Generally, tenants pay just 30% of their income for rent. And that services are in these buildings. When you're providing homes for people who've experienced instability, services are a critical component of making sure that people can um, stay stable in housing and get their lives back on track. But the services are also voluntary. We make sure that they're trauma-informed. They consist of a variety of different services, which I will talk about in a minute, but essentially one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff, uh, case management staff, making sure that people have independent living skills, and of course, referral services for a variety of the various needs. Next slide. So at a community of friends, we approach our work with the following beliefs or, or philosophy. We do believe in housing first. We believe that recovery is possible, even with the conditions that I mentioned. And these homes should be in communities where people live, no concentration in a particular neighborhood, that people who've experienced homelessness they came from communities and they should live in the communities. We believe in integration, meaning again, no concentration. It's not 100% necessarily, uh, buildings should not be 100%, particularly large buildings of people who've experienced homelessness. We all live in communities where, where it is uh, a variety of different people, a variety of different socioeconomic status, and that's what makes diversity and our lives so interesting. So we believe integration is important and we normalize that. And Last but not least is whatever it takes, right? People have a lot of um, different uh, circumstances that led them to homelessness and their disabling conditions. And so we take a whatever it takes approach to make sure that people can stay stable in housing. Next slide. So housing first. I think sometimes it's a little bit confusing because in our view, housing first is both a philosophy and is a strategy. As a philosophy, we believe that people cannot focus on their well-being or even begin to address the issues that cause their homelessness, whether it's trauma, medical issues, mental health, addiction, job loss, all until and unless they have a place to live. Where will people put their medication if they don't have a place to live? Where, whose address do they give out when they're trying to apply, uh, a job, apply for a job? Or where can they retreat to manage their health or any other issues that may surface? But it's also a strategy because the first thing you do 
in implementing housing first is to actually provide that stable home, one that's affordable without conditions and with services in those buildings. It's also a strategy in the sense that it's a flexible model that can be adapted to various types of homes that you offer to people experiencing homelessness. It's not just in permanent supportive housing, although of course that's where we apply this particular philosophy and strategy. Next slide. So what are the elements of housing first in permanent supportive housing? Definitely it's low barrier. We do not require sobriety. We don't necessarily you know, screen people out because of credit checks. We don't require landlord references. All those conditions that make it harder for people to actually have a home, we don't put that in place in housing first. It is a strategy that is non-punitive. Housing is not used as a threat. If you don't do this, if you don't behave this way, you can't have a home. That's not what housing first is. And it is certainly one based on consumer choice and self-determination. We work in partnership with our tenants in the buildings to set goals for their well-being and to take control of their own lives. We all don't like to, people telling us what to do. And so one of the most important things is to get people back on track and to provide that stability is not to have these conditions, not for it to be punitive. Let people decide for themselves what they need and want in their lives to be well and to participate back in society again. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no accountability. It doesn't mean that people move in and do whatever it is that they like. There's rules. There's always rules in living in an apartment building, for instance. You have to have, you know, you have to pay your rent. You have to make sure that you are allowing other people quiet enjoyment of the premises. And that we teach people moving in that there's consequences to people's actions. It's an accountability provision that helps people get stable in housing. And I mentioned services. It's, it's available. It's our job as providers to be as creative as we can to engage people, but it is voluntary. You know, Housing First helps people get into housing before we can even start talking about medical care or sobriety. Housing is the beginning. It is not the end and it's certainly not a reward. And Housing First is um, a wonderful philosophy because it can be applied to other types of housing options as well to help people be successful, such as, you know, you can apply Housing First to interim housing. But it is definitely most effective when you pair it with supportive housing because supportive housing is not time limited. It's with a lease. And so that really fosters the stability in order to end homelessness. Next slide. And the type of services that are provided, it ranges. It, I mentioned earlier, it's whatever it takes. So you start with case management. You provide those life skills that help people learn to cook again and to, to clean their apartments. You provide that mental health support. You make sure you have addiction recovery services available in the event that that is the next goal for someone moving into permanent housing. Health and wellness is critically important. People who have lived, been living in the streets and their cars have not taken care of their health. And having those op uh, options available is very important for stability and wellness. I mentioned housing children too. You know, when we started off, we were focusing on single adults, but we know that there are families uh, with children in their, in their care that also need the support to deal with the trauma that comes from living on the streets or in shelters over an extended period of time. So those services are also offered as part of Housing First. Domestic violence support is important. There's a small segment of our uh, tenancy that also has encountered situations where um, that led to their homelessness. And of course, employment service and professional development. Uh, and connection to benefits. And we don't do this work by ourselves. We work in partnership with many other social service organizations in Los Angeles and Orange County and the communities that we work in. And so our partnerships include more than two dozen different social service agencies in order to make housing first effective. Next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit now about the success, right? How do we know this works? You know, we all measure. Uh, our tenancy, 93% of our community friends tenants are, um, that have special needs are below 30% of the area median income. 76% have a diagnosed mental illness. And 71% are chronically homeless at entry. And we have an estimated 46% of people who have a diagnosed substance addiction. And with this group of people living in a building with Housing First, we've been able to measure 
at three years stability and 88% of our tenants remain stable in housing after three years. Housing First works, making sure that people have an opportunity to move into housing before you can start addressing their concerns really leads to a stable life after a while. I think that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer questions, Diane. Thank you, Dora. It's such good work. And I appreciate you doing it. I appreciate your leadership and um, sharing it on today's call. So we do have a lot of questions and several of them are about funding sources. How do you fund the housing component and how do you fund the services component? Yeah, I think I think you mentioned someone named Ms. Brown asked those questions about funding. We use all of it <laughs> from a, and I think uh, Greg mentioned the uh, operating investments and the capital investments, right? So I'll start with the capital. When we build permanent supportive housing, one of the unique um, observations we've made is that there's no one entity that will provide the resources to fund everything. No bank will, no state government, no local government, um, and no federal government entity. So what we have to do is come um, gather to the, all the different types of capital financing programs available and to make it work. So we have a little bit of city funding, we have a little bit of county funding, we have a little bit of state funding. And each of those government agencies have resources, uh, uh, different types of resources. Uh, most local governments in Los Angeles, you know, we take advantage of the home program, critically important for the production of um, uh, affordable housing. Some communities use community development block grant funds for housing as well. Uh, we also have bond measures that the citizens vote for or our local elected officials put on, on the ballot. Um, and then at the state level, also bond measures and state general fund. And then we obviously are high utilizer at the low income housing tax credit program for the permanent housing standpoint. So that's the capital side. But in supportive housing, as I mentioned, it's affordable. So we also need rental subsidies. Our rental subsidies are project based, not tenant based. That ensures that that's one less thing that a, that a tenant have to worry about, an applicant who's, who's homeless does not need to worry about how they're gonna afford the rent. We as a nonprofit developer will actually apply for rent a subsidy programs through our local housing authority or directly through, through HUD or even the VA because they have the HUD DASH program that can be project-based to serve veterans. So we apply for those rental subsidies for the building and a tenant only comes in from a low barrier standpoint, homelessness and certification disability. That's really all we need. Um, and then on the service side, services is probably one of the hardest things to fund. We um, are able in many cases to pull a little bit of service funding from the building itself. The building operates by tenants paying rent. We have the rental subsidies and we add as an expense the services provision. But we also go to our local county, the county of Los Angeles, the Orange County Healthcare Agency to provide resources on the services side. And then last but not least is fundraising. Most of us who work in the nonprofit sector working in the, in the homeless services space have to do a fair amount of fundraising to fill those gaps that all these government entities and programs don't fund. Thanks, Dora. Another question comes from an anonymous attendee or they ask it anonymously. And this person says um, that they are a person who lives with a physical, she's, they say as a person who lives with a physical disability, I feel very vulnerable around folks who be, whose behavior might be physically threatening when under the influence. How does combi the combining of these two groups of people work out with regard to safety? Yeah, I mean, we talk about safe housing, right? And what does that really mean? At all of our buildings and in most supportive housing developments, if it's done correctly, you have appropriate staffing from both the services standpoint as well as the property manager standpoint. And when the occasion warrants, we will have additional security brought in as well. But the, the key issue I think that has to happen is an understanding of what it means to be um, a good uh, tenant. And that falls on the services and property management staff to develop a community at each building, to have community meetings, to talk about the accountability that I mentioned and to address issues the beauty of having services staff on site is to address issues as they arise. So if someone is in fact um, um, actively using 
The encouragement is to have what we call harm reduction, to reduce the harm to themselves and to manage it in their apartment and not in the common space. I mentioned the accountability piece about uh, behaviors and consequences. You know, having the staffing and the security needed to make sure that everyone feels safe is really important. And that's the responsibility of the people working there. And I would also say that if someone is feeling in their own communities unsafe, they should definitely talk to the staff on site. Um, all providers who work, do this work have, a, have an interest in making sure that people stay safe in housing. And so there are means of having community work within the building, talking to all the tenants and creating that safe environment, providing tools and techniques to deal with situations that may occur. Thanks, Dora. And then the last question I'll ask you for today right now comes from Robert Barrett, who asks, what is the average proportion of rent subsidized to market rate housing in your facilities? I'm not sure I understand that question. Is it asking how much the, how much the tenants pay in terms of, terms of what's the versus the market rate housing? No, I think it's asking if your developments are all deeply affordable or if it's mixed income housing. Oh, for for us, um, different developers, different nonprofits run it differently. But at a community of friends. We serve people who are predominantly a 30% area median income, which is about 93% of our tenants. Um, and then the other percentage is uh, what we call regular affordable housing, and we don't go higher than 60% of area median income. The vast majority of those who are not 30% are at 50%. Okay, and actually, I'm going to ask you one one last question. This one's really going to be the last one from Michael Howard, who asks, what proportion of the residents in your community take advantage of voluntary supportive services? Oh, it's well over 90%. It's well over 90%. I think it is a fallacy for people to think that people who've experienced homelessness don't want services. <laughs> um, they don't want the type of certain services that come with threats. Uh, but once they're in, a, in an apartment building and they see that the case management staff and even the property managers all have a real interest in the success of that particular tenant. Um, and then the fact that we really uh, try to hire people who are creative in engagement, um, eventually, uh, in the, actually right in the very beginning, um, we have a very high participation rate. And eventually most people, if close to 100%, will take advantage of the services in the building. And it could be as something as, as simple as helping them read the forms um, on uh, you know, forms that come to them from various agencies. That's uh, a participation in services is one way of getting the initial engagement and then enroping them in on other types of services, whether it's health or um, uh, professional development, leadership, training, and um, um, what we have children family services as well. Great, thank you so much, Dora. Really appreciate your work and appreciate you being here today to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. All right, our next speaker comes from Missouri, from Empower Missouri. And many of you may have heard about some harmful legislation that was recently passed in the state of Missouri related to people experiencing homelessness. So Sarah Owsley, who is the Policy and Advocacy Director um, of Empower Missouri, a little bit about the threat that is posed by this new legislation that was enacted. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. This is where we make up any missing time in the agenda today. So thanks, Diane, and the whole team at NLIHC for inviting me on to speak. Uh, Empower Missouri is a 120-year-old social justice advocacy organization focusing on state legislative advocacy to end poverty. We lead work to reform the criminal, criminal legal system, ensure nutrition access, and grow the availability and accessibility of safe and affordable housing. Uh, Missouri has over 6,500 neighbors who were found to be outside sleeping in 2022. We have hundreds of nonprofit experts who provide housing assistance, services, and more to end homelessness in our state. Uh, Missouri is a very interesting state to focus on regional policy. We have a conservative supermajority in the House and Senate who regularly will call for freedom of choice and small government but we'll also regularly use the General Assembly to force cities in Missouri to operate in a specific way. Uh, when I started five years ago, very few lawmakers were talking about housing policy, homelessness, or the critical shortage of affordable homes in our state. 
Over time, we've raised awareness with lawmakers and helped to pass policies to increase the affordable housing stock and increase resources available to housing insecure families. However, this last legislative session was a very difficult one for us advocates. Some lawmakers in Missouri were asked to sponsor and advance legislation uh, that was supposed to encourage new ideas to address homelessness. These lawmakers really never spoke to folks in Missouri, uh, in the housing space or nonprofits in our state, uh, choosing instead to sponsor the model legislation they were provided from Cicero Institute. This came at a real surprise to us uh, because we had previously worked with these two specific bill uh, sponsors on anti-poverty work and knew them to be folks who really care about their jobs as lawmakers and about people in poverty. I offered testimony uh, against these bills in the Missouri State House and Senate with the support of multiple housing providers uh, behind me and with me. Uh, the only testimony in the House or Senate in support of these bills came from an out-of-state lobbyist who flew into Missouri and then flew back out. Uh, dozens of individuals with lived experience, uh, nonprofit housing providers, and social service agencies offered testimony against. Uh, ultimately, one of the bill sponsors offered the language as an amendment when the chamber was mostly empty at the end of a long day of debate. It was added onto a bill that was mostly about county reimbursements. Uh, the final bill is over 110 pages long, and the three pages that deal with homelessness are in the middle. Uh, lawmakers um, outside of the sponsors have shared with us that they didn't really understand what this language would look like in our state, what it would really do. Um, some say that they were misled about the language or believed that they were voting uh, on a bill about education. Uh, we led our network in making hundreds of contacts with lawmakers in the last few days of session, uh, but ultimately the language passed as included uh, as amended onto this other bill. Almost never in the state of Missouri is a bill introduced uh, for the first time and passed all in the same session. Uh, and the bill was signed ultimately by our governor and will go into effect January 1st, 2023. Uh, there are two pieces of the legislation we're worried about. The first is a redirection of all housing funds in the state, including federal funds. Uh, the language specifies that the state cannot build any new permanent supportive housing units and instead directs fundings towards uh, sanctioned camps outdoors. These camps are not going to be able to follow housing first. Uh, the language specifies that all guests there must engage in services, including a mental health evaluation, drug rehab, and drug testing. These camps will also only allow guests to stay for a maximum of two years if they follow all the rules. Uh, I'm sure most people on this call can understand many individuals experiencing chronic homelessness will be unable to self-sustain their housing in under two years. Uh, it's also clear in many of the stories shared before me that compulsory services are less effective than allowing people to stabilize and experience safety before adding a bunch of requirements to their lives or new requirements to their lives. Um, advocates are concerned about how this may impact our future HUD grants and what types of programming we can offer in the state. The language also includes a financial penalty for communities who have higher rates of homelessness. So essentially the larger cities which have more accessible services um, will now receive less funding. Uh, this strongly discourages communities from working harder to get an accurate um, count of people outside during our pit counts because increased numbers could result in fewer resources. The second piece creates a misdemeanor for sleeping on state land, which is enforceable by jail time or a fine up to $750. Uh, we were able to get a warning written into the language. However, it doesn't specify how long of a warning is required. So some law enforcement officers might interact with a person on the streets and give them a 24 hour warning uh, while their peer may interact with that same person 20 minutes later and they could be cited. Uh, bill sponsors, have been sharing around the state that this law would only be enforced if there's adequate shelter in the area of that person who is experiencing homelessness. However, that is not what the language actually says and partners around the state are already reporting more interaction uh, between people who live outside and law enforcement. In addition to burdening our neighbors with fines and fees for simply being alive outdoors, the language passed requires cities and municipalities to enforce the camping ban, even if they don't want to. Uh, it allows the attorney general to sue cities if they don't enforce the ban on state-owned land in their area, uh, further removing resources designed to house people um, and uh, will be spent on lawsuits. So the language really removes uh, resources from proven solutions to homelessness, uh, which is housing, which is housing first programming, which is 
uh, voluntary services. Uh, and then it penalizes communities with increased homelessness. Uh, individuals experiencing homelessness face tremendous burden to securing affordable housing, uh, and we are increasing those burdens and harming our nonprofit partners with this language. An individual who is sleeping outside is already an unattractive tenant to many landlords, um, and now those individuals may also have a uh, criminal record and misdemeanor on their record. As I said, the law goes into effect on January 1. Uh, there's already one lawsuit brought forward by a not-for-profit agency in the state against the new law. Um, this agency is a uh, housing provider and a services provider and would be unable to do that or unable to expand their successful programming um, under this uh, law. And they'd no longer be able to access HUD funds uh, for their programming as a result of this law because they are housing first. Uh, more lawsuits are sure to come. And Empower Missouri will continue to work with national and local advocates to do all we can to help our neighbors get access to safe and affordable housing in our state. Sarah, thanks so much for sharing this. It's just outrageous and deeply worrying. And there are many people in the Q&A box sharing their outrage and horror at this new legislation. Um, and asking the question of who is behind this and who was advocating for this legislation. And some people are noting that similar legislation is advancing in other states as well. So anything you wanna share on that? Yeah, the language is exactly the same as what the Censoro Institute had on their website for a length of time. Um, the individual who offered testimony in support of that was um, a Cicero staff person, identified himself as such uh, by the name of Judge Glock. Um, so we are, um, you know, sort of unifying around um, many of these same type of uh, legislation that's moving across the country that I believe is also modeled off of that language from the Cicero Institute. Right. And this, that's, this is actually part of the reason why we international partners are holding this webinar series is really to sound the alarm about this harmful legislation that is advancing in some places, other places it hasn't been as successful, but um, there's a real concern about other similar laws passing at the state level um, in other areas of the country. So Sarah, can you say a little bit about what's next and to the extent that you can share what legal challenges there may be to this legislation and what hope there is of striking it down? Yeah, absolutely. So for sure, there's been one filed lawsuit from an agency outside of the Springfield area here in Missouri. Um, and they are really um, suing on the basis of their resources, their access to federal resources that are designed to end homelessness are now unaccessible to them um, as a proven housing first program um, that is uh, really showing solutions um, and um, has great outcomes in their community. Um, so they would no longer be accessible. Um, there is uh, likely other lawsuits coming. I'm not sure how much I am really allowed to share about it. Certainly the idea of arresting folks for simply being outdoors when they don't have anywhere else to be um, is outlandish and um, is ripe for um, a lawsuit in addition to um, we will now house those folks right in the criminal legal system. Um, and so we're removing the possibility to use federal funds that are designated for this type of, um, of service offering. Uh, we're removing that opportunity in the state while also then asking Missouri taxpayers to subsidize uh, those same individuals living in potentially even more difficult life uh, behind bars and then for a period of time um, with a record of a misdemeanor um, on there. We should also understand that folks who are living outdoors may be experiencing a variety of mental health challenges um, that increase their vulnerability as they interact with law enforcement, um, whereas they may very well do um, you know, a very stable uh, job uh, later on in a housing first housing provider. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing this. As disturbing as it is, it's really important that everybody be aware that this is happening. I hope you will continue to let us know how we can be helpful in your efforts to push back against this in the state of Missouri. And we'll certainly have you back in the future to share with us updates on this legislation. So thanks for your work and thanks for joining today. Yeah, please do. Thanks so much, Diane. I appreciate the invitation. 
So we'll turn now to um, our speakers who are going to share some local advocacy work that they've done to educate local policymakers and federal policymakers about the importance of Housing First and share some ideas for what other advocates and impacted people can be doing in your communities. So I'm really pleased to um, turn it over now to Bonnie Harper, who's a HUD grant housing specialist with Partners Behavioral Health Management, and to Michelle Knapp, who's the Executive Director of Fifth Street Ministries. Bonnie and Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining. Good afternoon. Could I go to the first slide, please? I'm going to share with you how the opportunity came up for us to be able to have an on-site slash really good discussion with our local congressman, um, Patrick McHenry. It all started when I was asked to speak about the permanent supportive housing program that I managed with partners. And during that opportunity time, I got to explain to Doug Nations, who is the current legislator director for Patrick McHenry, and put faces and, and, and names with individuals for the permanent supportive housing program. When I, when I made the, the presentation, I wanted to do it in a nonpartisan way because at that time, the political arena was very heated. And that's one thing that I felt everybody from all political parties, all religious leaders, doesn't matter what walk of life you are in, that everybody agrees that the permanent supportive housing population, the most vulnerable population, needs housing first in order for it to be successful. And by the time we were done with the presentation, Mr. Doug Nations had some wonderful questions about the program and the work that we were doing in Region 4. And when we set up the site visit, we were able to share knowledge from the people with the boots on the ground, as well as with our agencies that we work with and partner with. And we've got to elevate the challenges and opportunities to the public. And we established a public record for congressional members' positions through the local media. And most importantly, we got a conversation that makes it reliable source for the congressional staff. It was a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to bring everybody to everybody together on one common ground. And that was, is people really do care about the homeless population and the most vulnerable population. Next slide, please. So we collaborated in a strategic planning from the start and it included Dekimos from Fifth Street Ministries. They're a shelter, a direct services and a housing provider and partners health management and then the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. And we all got together and we, we decided how we were gonna present this collaboration, this new idea and bring everybody together and educate our congressmen. And Michelle, you can take it from there. All right, Will you, next slide, slide please. It, it wasn't um, by chance that our agency was chosen to host the congressman. Fifth Street has been in operation for 32 years, and our success is greatly um, hinged on the support that we receive and the relationships that we have made in our community. Um, in addition to the relationships, we have been educating the community over the past year on Housing First, as well as barriers to homelessness, or I'm sorry, barriers to housing. <laughs> Um, so uh, when we found out Patrick McHenry was, was coming to our site, we had just over a week to, to um, come up with a guest list, who we were going to have speak, and to make the biggest impact while he was here. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we invited our local mayor, Costi Coutte, who has been a supporter of our agency, as well as home, the homeless issues over the past um, 20 years. Uh, he spoke and was, uh, was able to paint a picture of our issues that are in Statesville, North Carolina. Um, we also had formerly homeless individuals that, that participated in HUD programs, were in permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and, and utilized the Housing First model to get them housed. Though the impact of those individuals was definitely the most impactful um, part of the program that day. 
Uh, we had we had two homeless, formerly homeless individuals. Both of them were able to speak well of of all the services that they received and have were able to show how successful they are today. And it was because of the Housing First and HUD-based programs that they are successful. We also had our local United Way executive director. Um, and and one, another important key person that we had was Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw works with um, those that are mentally ill that have been uh, in our program for many years. He sees that Housing First works and supportive services work. And he has been an advocate for us for many years. Not only is he a doctor and provides services to those that we serve, he has been a volunteer with our organization since he was a teenager. So he has been around, he is a great advocate within our community. We also had faith leadership there to show the, the need that the faith community has seen come to them um, looking for support from the faith um, leadership. So um, next slide, slide please. Um, as part of that meeting, we, we showed the, um, the success of Housing First and the programs associated with Housing First and how um, they are working here in, in the district um, that he serves, that the Congressman serves. Um, next slide. And as part of that visit, we had many news outlets there. Um, and so, um, it was very helpful to get that word out, what we are doing here in our community, that the Congressman is also very active in, in, in working with the homeless population and providing funding for these services. Of, obviously, we need more funding, more housing opportunities, um, but it definitely these programs definitely work and, and we um, have many, many success stories to show that it works and try to cut that short for you. So if there's any questions, um, we're available. It's such great work, Michelle. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. And just to be sure that everybody who's on this webinar understands, Representative Patrick McHenry is a Republican member of Congress. He's the senior most Republican on the House Financial Services Committee, which is a very influential and powerful committee and he's the ranking member as it's known. And if the Republicans take the majority of the House um, next year, he will be the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. So having him hear from Bonnie and Michelle about your good work is so important and so powerful. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And a question that was asked is whether and how you intend to keep this going, whether you plan to meet with other federal, state, or local legislators, and what tips you would offer to others who want to do the same. This is about, what I would say is one of the things that we felt was very effective is that we really talked about individuals, not names, but exactly their situation, made it a, a nonpartisan issue that this is a real issue that's affecting our communities, our neighbors, and our country. And I think that's one thing that we can all agree on, that, that housing first does work. When you, when you enter the permanent supportive housing program with partners, you do get a Bonnie as a caseworker right away. So you do have some supports already in place. And then we build that relationship up. And once we have that relationship built up, then we can work with their physical, their brain health, getting the income that they need. And I think when we talk to the, the congressmen and our senators about that these are real human beings, and this is a humanitarian need, that everybody can come together on this. This is a nonpartisan issue. This is about our neighbors and our community and the hurt that's out there. Sending individuals to prison because they're walking around waving their hands, talking to themselves is not the answer. And it's not when we have to change that thought process and educate our leaders in that. Great, I couldn't agree more. Bonnie and Michelle, thank you so much for your great work and advocacy. And thanks for sharing it on today's webinar. Take care. Thank you. So last but not least, we're gonna hear from Steve Berg, who all of you probably know very well. He's the VP for Programs and Policy at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And he's going to share some other 
actions that you can take now. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Diane. Thanks to everybody who's been on this call. Um, a lot of great information and inspiring work by people around the country. Um, Steve Burke from the National Alliance in Homelessness. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to run through this quickly. Um, one, I want to tell people about an opportunity. You just heard some, from some people talking to their member of Congress. And this is an opportunity to talk to your members of Congress. There's a virtual Hill Day is going to take place on Wednesday, September 14th. This will be uh, a way everybody can meet with either their member of Congress or their top staff people. Meetings will be set up for you. These are virtual meetings. Um, meetings will be set up for you. Uh, there'll be a lot of help getting prepared. So if you've never met with your member of Congress and talked about uh, funding for homeless programs and housing programs, this is a great opportunity. If you wanna get involved, please email Jerry Jones. Um, you can see his email right there. He's running. He is uh, running this event and there'll be plenty of time to get involved and get up to speed on it. Um, next slide, please. There are some other things available to help. The Low Income Housing Coalition has a toolkit that, uh, that talks about a lot of the different kinds of things that people can do to get involved with their, with their uh, members of Congress. Um, it include, you can get that through their website and it includes uh, a longer term housing agenda. The, the, the Virtual Hill Day is gonna be talking about uh, sort of short term decisions that Congress is gonna be making about funding homelessness programs and housing programs. The, the toolkit also has some longer term uh, steps in it about getting more vouchers, get, getting more funds to develop housing and getting funds for emergency responses to homelessness and to eviction prevention. Um, the immediate need is for people to co members of Congress to co-sponsor these bills and then to carry that on into the next Congress to build more bipartisan support for these important, uh, important tools. Next slide, please. Uh, just some tips about how to talk to members of Congress about this. If you participate in the virtual Hill Day, you get a lot more of this kind of information, but it's really being clear that homelessness affects the entire community and that we over the years have developed ways that really work that you heard some about today that really work to get people off the streets and into housing and reduce the amount of homelessness in a community. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to take a moment to talk about the annual spending bills. That's where, as people probably know, every year Congress does these appropriations bills that fund the various federal government programs for the year. Uh, key programs like the Homeless Assistance Grants, the Continuum of Care Program for Homeless Assistance, like tenant-based rental assistance and other HUD housing programs. Right now, the, uh, the process for passing those bills is a little slowed down, uh, mired, I think you can use the word. Um, when final decisions will be made is a little unclear, maybe October, maybe December, maybe even next year. The, in, in, time, in years like this, where the appropriations process is slowed down, it's very important to have a constant drumbeat going to members of Congress about the importance of this spending and to keep that going throughout the year, starting uh, right away and, and until they finally get the job done to, to fund these bills. So we're, we're hoping, we along with partners at the Low Income Housing Coalition Center on Budget and other partners all over the country, we're hoping people will continue to do this work throughout the year um, so we can get the funding we need. Um, next slide, please. And that's me. I'm always happy to hear from people either by email or on Twitter um, who are doing this kind of work and have questions or have, uh, have uh, 
stories to tell that other people need to know about. And again, thank you all for being here today and we hope you can get involved and stay involved in this work ongoing. Great, thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate your, your partnership in all of this work. So we've reached the end of our agenda and I want to again thank our national partners in this work, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities who are together um, putting forward this webinar series with us. I want to remind you all that there are two more webinars in this series. The next one is on Monday, September 12th, same time, 2.30 to 4. The topic will be long-term solutions and successful strategies. And then the fourth and final webinar in this series will be on Wednesday, September 28th at the same time, 2.30 to 4. And the topic for that one will be how to address unsheltered homelessness. So thanks again to all of you for joining today. Many thanks to our speakers and we will see you all again soon. Please take care. Bye-bye.